the sound back there? Good. It's good. good. And if I don't use the mic, how's the sound? Fine. Okay, I, I, I'll do both. Now, when John asked me to, to come and uh, be with you, we uh, first talked about, you know, kind of a more town hall meeting thing, which excited me a little bit because I, then I get to interact a little more. And then it also means I don't necessarily have a time limit. And if you give me a mic and let me go, I'm just going to keep going. Now, <clears throat> I did want to uh, tout Citizens for Choice in Healthcare's form. And uh, just know where I'm coming from is I, I'm involved in a different freedom group. So I'm on their board and I, I work with another freedom group, but Citizens and Choice in Healthcare is one of the oldest health freedom groups left standing. And there are fewer groups now than there have ever been. And that's because everyone is calm. Because they, they have no appreciation what's coming. And, and why wouldn't they be calm? I mean, we've had these natural health product regulations now for 14 years. And for those of you, um, who have been involved in things for a while, you just know what a headache it was. But let me just ask, how many people have heard me speak before? I just, I wanna, so not a lot, perfect, okay. <clears throat> and um, how many people have been part of a health freedom group before? Oh wow, not many. Okay, well, I, I think I'm gonna start by, because there's so many people who don't know who I am, I'm gonna let you know how I got involved in this. Because I grew up in a family that if you got sick, you went to the medical doctor, and if that doctor felt that you needed a chemical pharmaceutical drug, that's what you got. And the idea of, of going to a nutritionist or a health food store or a traditional Chinese practitioner, a naturopath or a homeopathic doctor, you might as well have been talking Greek. I mean, I, we, our eyes would glaze over. And, and I was uh, working in a law firm in Kamloops, and there was a herbalist in Kamloops named Jim Strauss. Does anyone yep. hear? Yes. Okay, a few people. Now, Jim's now no longer with us, but back then he was a very fiery herbalist. And he was suing the federal government because the federal government, he was importing herbs from the United States, herbs that are perfectly legal to own. And Health Canada seized them at the border. And so he was suing Health Canada. And there's a, there's a very special technical legal term for when the government takes your property, it's called theft. But um, <laughs> so anyway, I'm ashamed to say that I, I got the file to defend Health Canada because the firm I was at had the Department of Justice contract for the area. So I go to court uh, against Jim Strauss and I have his thing thrown out. He was in the wrong court, he didn't have a clue what he was doing. And then uh, after that, he took me for lunch, which speaks volumes about his character, doesn't it? And um, shortly after that, I, I started my own firm, and he got charged with practicing medicine without a license. So the province was going after him. I mean, Health Canada had tried and uh, failed, and now the province is going after him, and he was charged with practicing medicine without a license. And this is in BC, and in BC, the, the act that gives doctors the medical monopoly defines the practice of medicine so broadly that it includes making treatment claims. And now this is important because censorship is key to all of this. Okay? We, you are controlled health-wise by truthful information being kept from you, and I'll, I'll come back to that during this, this evening. But So only doctors can make health claims, and Jim was, Jim was making health claims for sure. He drove around in a white van, just covered with red letters, we cure heart disease. Okay? And that's, that's why they were going after him, is he had these, these heart drops, and he was claiming to cure heart disease. So, uh, and you know, some people are smiling, and, and some of you might think that that's an irresponsible thing for him to do. Um, but let me give you his history. So, he was from Austria, he actually flew, uh, dive bombers in the Second World War for the Germans. And just so you know his age, and it, it, from Austria, his family were traditional healers for 400 years. And he was trained, you can't see me, well, yeah. that it's gonna be a problem wherever I stand, so I'll move around, but. So he was trained by his grandparents, dragged out into the forest, and, and they, they did it all by taste. Like now we're, you know, you do an assay for the you know, the act of ingredients in your herbs. Well, back then you did it by taste. Oh, this is strong, this is weak, let's adjust the recipes. 
Well, he was working as an electrical engineer for BC Hydro. He has a heart attack. And he's rushed to the hospital, and they do an angiogram, and he's got one artery fully plugged, and another one, I think, was 80%. And they said to him, Jim, you have two options. You can die, or you can have a double bypass surgery. And he didn't like the dying option. He didn't like the double bypass surgery option. So he, uh, he said, you know, I'm going to go into the family business. And he makes his heart drops. And that was, I think, in 82. I mean, he died about five years ago in an old folks home, never having had a bypass surgery. And after he cured himself, he hung out a shingle and, and uh, started, started the family business. And so, you know, fast forward, he's now charged with practicing medicine without a license because he's, he's pushing these heart drops. And I, you, you're a lawyer and you're hired, you, you know, you want to want to succeed for your client. I'm looking at the law, you can't make health claims unless you're a doctor. And he's making health claims. And I'm going, how am I going to defend this guy? And he couldn't shut up. And, you know, like all the judges in Kamloops at the time, they were old men. And I know I put Jim on the stand, and he'd be testifying, and he'd stop, and he'd look at the judge, and the judge invariably would have crow's feet on his ear, and he'd say, Your Honor, you have Heart disease, you need my heart drops. I can cure you. I mean, that's exactly what he would do. So I thought, how am I going to defend this guy? And then I thought, well, I'm going to go after the law. We have in Canada freedom of expression, section two of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And we have this law that says you can't make health claims, even truthful health claims. So I served notice on the Crown, and as soon as you do that in a constitutional case, you're not now against one crown, you're always against a team of crowns. You know, often I'm, you're, when I do that, you're up about you know, five or six lawyers against you. And so the constitutional team got involved and, and you know, so I've got to start preparing for trial and I go to Jim's shop, it was a little herb shop called Natural Way Herbs. It was totally a mom and pop shop, like nothing professional about this at all. And I sit down there and I say, Jim, like, I know there won't be any clinical evidence, anything like that, but is there any way that we can show you're telling the truth? And, and the reason I'm asking, Jim, is, is, you know, freedom of expression protects all expression, truthful expression, false expression. But if I can ch convince the judge you're telling the truth, I mean, you're going to be more likely as a judge to be willing to strike down legislation for violating freedom of expression if you believe it's truthful. It's just common sense, right? It's just psychology here. So we're like, Jim, is there any way we can, we can show you're telling the truth? And he, oh, hang on a second. He just walks in the back and he starts bringing me out boxes. And I forget how many boxes. I remember it was an odd number, so it was three or five. And they were just filled with letters that people had written them. And, and he didn't ask people to write him letters, but people felt compelled. So I take these letters back to my office and I start reading them and they were, they were all the same. I had heart disease, I was sick, I was dying, I took your heart drops, I got better, you know, thank you, God bless you, that type of thing. Now, those letters are useless in court, pure hearsay. But I call the people who wrote the letters. <clears throat> and so, I just started phoning these people. And on the day of trial, I had five middle class professionals, which I just picked for credibility reasons. They all had had heart disease. They all had had at least one open heart bypass surgery. One of them had had two. They had all continued to have heart disease because the reason their arteries was plugging up was not being addressed. They all needed another bypass surgery to survive. And here's where they differed. Is a couple of them were too weak to survive the surgery, so the doctors ethically can't do it. So they basically said to them, well, you know, there's nothing we can do, go home and die. And the others, um, they weren't actually willing to go through that experience again if it was only going to buy them a little more time. They just weren't. So for all of them, the medical system was now a dead end, no pun intended, and they, they started looking for other answers. They come across these heart drops, they get well. None of them had been able to work for years. They're all back at work on the trial date, which is very telling. One of them even wrote a book on, on this experience, uh, Doug Henderson, called Diet and Exercise as a Croc. You can still buy it. 
And, um, and so there we are, day of trial. And now that experience was my road to Damascus conversion. Because when I was acting for Health Canada, I was being told, hey, this guy's a rogue herbalist. And, and I'm not meaning to upset anyone here, but he was selling unapproved products. Products that the government had not approved of. Can you imagine that? And I, I'm like, oh, this is dangerous. Like, I gotta shut this guy down in court. Like, we can't have that. I gotta protect people like you. I'm ashamed now. I'm happy to say I'm ashamed. But by the time that I had prepared for that trial, it was like, wait a second, danger wasn't leaving those heart drops on the market. The danger was taking them away, and I had the addresses and phone numbers and names of thousands of people that were only alive because they were on the market. And that kind of forced me to completely, and if anyone else has their phone on, if you guys want to turn them off just so we don't get that. Uh, So, uh, yes. yeah, so I came to realize, actually, that we're talking about really, really important things. And even the idea that the government could tell you that you can't access something when other things aren't working, I kind of had to, I kind of had to work on that for a while. And, you know, now I'm fully there. But I just wanted to share with you, first of all, that's how I got involved. And, you know, that's where I'm coming from. Now... <clears throat> And then after that, basically what happened is this other natural health product firm started calling me, and I, I just, I was shocked with what I found. I'm going to share with you guys later a, a story of True Hope. And, uh, I mean, it, it's just compelling. But you're here today, and Citizens for Choice have asked you to be here because we've got some changes coming down the pipe. And it's called this self-care framework. And <clears throat> most people have no idea of kind of what's going on with it but it's it's very dangerous and for those of you that have been in the fight for a while it, it's quite concerning but i wanted to um first ask you guys um we've got our drug law is basically an act called the food and drug act and then there's regulations under the food and drug act you know so there's regulations for new drug approval process and, and chemical drugs and and natural health products. Um, does anyone here actually know what the purpose of our of our drug laws are? Like, like, what is the government or health? It really is Health Canada that writes them. So, why why do we have these drug laws? Any any ideas out there? I'm just curious what thoughts might be. Standardization. Standardization. Okay. What do you mean by that? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so preventing basically fraudulent labels, okay, which is a safety issue, right? Okay. Safety. Safety. Okay. I I was in, in the very back there. Yes. Oh, well, I might ask you for some details lady, yeah. later. And then there's a lady in the back. You had your hand up? Yeah. yeah. So, the, uh, the law, for Right, okay. That, now let's switch to Health Canada. So we've got drug laws and, you know, kind of a consensus that they're there for our safety, kind of. Um, but I, I think saying that different, but you I want to think, intervene? I think they're there to keep us sick. Okay, so somebody, somebody has a different approach. I really do. Now, what about Health Canada? And, uh, and I'll tell you a funny story about Health Canada. But does anyone have. What, like Health Canada's there to protect us, right? Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, we've had we've had too many citizens from choice in healthcare in this room. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> let me tell you a funny story because it's just it, it's a learning experience when you do this. I was uh, running a trial in Calgary, 
I'm guessing this is about 12 years ago. It seems like forever, and there's a Health Canada inspector on the stand. And when you're a lawyer and you're cross-examining, you know where you want to go. And you know, you kind of build it up along the way, right? And I'm, I'm in the build-up phase. And you also only want to ask questions that you're pretty sure you're going to get the answer you want. And I was sure I was going to get a yes here. And so I suggest to this Health Canada inspector, I say, well, you know, you'd agree with me that the purpose of Health Canada is to protect, you know, Canadians. You're, you're here to protect our health. No. <laughs> and, you know, I, I tried a couple of times. I couldn't get her to agree that, you know, Health Canada was there to protect our health. And then she explained to me under oath, I, you know, and you don't want to be educated when you're the one asking questions. But she explained, no, no, Health Canada is there to enforce the Food and Drug Act and regulations. And it's like the little light bulb switch goes on. Of course they are. Here we have a law passed by Parliament and, you know, regulations that aren't passed by Parliament, they're just gazetted by the government. And somebody has to enforce that law. So Health Canada, they will tell you, even though they use safety, safety, safety to scare you and control you in their communications, under oath they'll tell you, no, we're not there for your safety. We're there to enforce the Food and Drug Act, and that's why there's, they're there, and that's why my question, like, well, why do you think the Food and Drug Act and, and these regulations are there? Because when you read them, you might think that they're there for your safety. I don't believe that anymore, and, um, <clears throat> I, and I, you know, it's town hall meeting, so I'm, I'm going to go off the script on some, some things. It's funny, how many people here know who Dr. Shiv Chopra was? Okay, a few hands. I thought we'd be more. Now, and Shiv died uh, this last year, but he was a senior drug approval scientist at Health Canada, um, mainly for human drugs, but for a part of his career, he ran the wing of Health Canada that approves veterinary drugs. And he became a whistleblower because Health Canada was going to approve uh, growth hormones in cows and all the science being shown to Health Canada was showing very, very bad, very dangerous. And he became a whistleblower and he forced the Senate to call a number of Health Canada scientists as witnesses. And basically everyone just spoke about how the department is, has been totally corrupted by pharmaceutical companies. And in fact, one, uh, Dr. Margaret Hayden, who spoke to the CBC, explained to the CBC that and she's a drug approval scientist. She says, yeah, after you've been at Health Canada for a while, and you know, you, a file's come across your desk and you're not going to approve this drug, but after you've been there for a while, you know how the management is going to get around your decision and have the drug approved, which is they appoint outside experts, not so why use the Health Canada taxpayers experts who say this drug isn't safe, that the benefits do not outweigh the risks, Let's appoint some outside experts who will look at it and say, oh yeah, no, this is perfectly safe. And then the management, who are not doctors and who are not scientists, can approve it and, and rinse and repeat. So, and I just bring that up because um, I became friends with Dr. Chopra and a man of pure integrity. And just, you know, in reading his book and having dialogues with him, I just became very, very concerned about how much influence there is in Health Canada. I mean, do you remember, uh, was it Deborah Gray, who was a reform MP from Alberta, and she couldn't count the number of times that pharma people attempted to bribe her. You know, like that saying, you know, if I had a penny for every time this happened. So, Sean, what was Shiv Chopra's book Corrupt to the Core. You can guess what that was about. So, I, I remember I was in Washington, D.C. This would probably be about 14 years ago because there was, their act is called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1984. And there was a, an act working its way through the Senate to kind of gut it. And so I was part of a group that was there doing some lobbying. And I remember we had just, um, we had just met with a senator who was sympathetic. And he had to leave to another meeting and we're packing up our stuff. And the senator's aide said, hey, I want to talk to you guys. Because he knew we were newbies in Washington, right? And he said, uh, and this guy, I'm guessing he'd probably be about 55, 56 at the time. And he explained he'd been working for senators and congressmen his whole career. So he was, this is what he did. This is still working? Yeah, I guess it is. I'm just not holding it right. 
And he said, I have to let you guys know that the pharmaceutical lobby is so strong that every senator and congressman in Washington actually watches the share price daily of the major pharmaceutical companies. And I forget at the time, I think it was like there was one, one and a half full-time pharmaceutical lobbyists for every senator and congressman. Now I think it's over two. It's gone up since then. But just <clears throat> the amount of influence is staggering. So let's talk about our, our drug approval model because there's some things about our Food and Drug Act and how we go about regulating that just convinces me that it's not there for our safety. And then I'll, I'll go into the self-care framework. But it's, I think it's just important for you to appreciate that, that the system is somewhat gained. So let's talk about serious conditions. If you want to sell a drug for a serious health condition, you have to go through what's called the new drug approval process. Now, <clears throat> it's probably been, I'm guessing, about seven years since I had an expert under oath tell me what the cost is to go through the drug approval process. But back then it was like minimum a billion dollars. Oh, that raised some eyebrows. Yeah, a billion dollars to get through the new drug approval process for a serious health condition. Okay? Now, <clears throat> because of the cost, and, and we don't have to just have that one approach, but we've chosen to do this, and this is deliberate. So, you know, that you start out with, you know, your purity tests and your animal tests and your safety tests and your efficacy tests and you work your way up to the big double-blind clinical trials and you have to provide Health Canada with at least two double-blind clinical trials that show that the drug works. And when they say show that it works, what they mean is, is that there's a statistical separation between the effect of the chemical drug and the sugar pill placebo. It doesn't mean that if you take it, it's gonna help you. It just means that they're able to show a statistical separation and there's a whole wing of statistics to tell us, does this work or this doesn't work? We have enough of a statistical separation. Now, the system's a little gamed though. So, because you might think, well, wait a second, this is pretty good. Before Health Canada's gonna approve a drug for a serious health condition, they've gotta have two large double-blind clinical trials showing them the drug works. But, I mean, that's pretty reassuring, isn't it? I mean, I feel reassured. Oh, I'm trying to make you feel better. So, <clears throat> let me just find something in my notes, because this is, this is good. Does any, who here knows who, uh, <clears throat> the, it's Marcia Angel. Marcia Angel is a medical doctor who has been the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for over two decades, probably closer to three decades now. And um, the New England Journal of Medicine is, I think, the largest blue chip medical journal in the world. And so all she's been doing for decades is assessing clinical trial research and deciding whether or not to include it in this blue chip publication. And she wrote a piece for the New York Times book review on a, a book that she wrote. And she's outlining in this piece all of the ways that pharmaceutical companies basically gain this double-blind clinical trial process. So you just basically structure it so that it's almost guaranteed to give you the results you want. And then she writes, and so I'm just, I'm quoting here from uh, January 1st, 2015, New York Review of Books, Volume 56, Number 1, and she's reviewed this book, Drug Companies and Doctors, A Story of Corruption. And this is her book. And, but this is now her words. And listen carefully. So and this is after she's outlined all the ways you can get a clinical trial to say what you want. She says, the problems I've discussed are not limited to psychiatry, although they reach their most florid form there. Similar conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine, particularly those that rely heavily on drugs and devices. Now listen carefully. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. 
I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, and that's just one voice. I mean, you can just Google the issue and there's book after book after book by medical doctors and scientists explaining how you know, most of the published research, but this is what Health Canada says you have to have to show that a drug works. So I, you know, I, I, I've shared her story. Let me share a story that I had. So I'm cross-examining a Health Canada expert on a court case. And this wasn't a Health Canada employee. This was a psychiatrist that, that Health Canada brought in as a heavy hitter, as a drug approval expert. And this psychiatrist, uh, ran a company that ran clinical trials mainly for psychiatric drugs to get approval from Health Canada or the FDA. So he was an expert in the design and running of clinical trials. He was an expert in getting uh, largely psychiatric drugs approved by Health Canada. And so he's under oath, I'm cross-examining him, and he's actually complaining to me that how hard it is to get two double-blind clinical trials, because you've got to get Health Canada two. And he's explaining under oath that for antidepressants, that the practice at the time was to run eight. So you run eight double-blind clinical trials, because on average, that's how many you needed to get two that showed that your drug worked better than the sugar pill. So you could have six that show no difference, or six that shows the sugar pill worked better. But you never give those to Health Canada. You give the two to Health Canada. And you never even have to tell Health Canada you ran the other ones. Now, this is all important because I'm going to explain to you that Health Canada is basically going to prevent natural health products from ever being used again to treat a serious health condition. And the reason is, is because we can't afford to go through this double-blind clinical trial process. And that's the only process that they will accept as showing that a drug works. Are you kidding me? So when Health Canada says, well, there's a, because one of the things they're doing is they're saying, there's a real danger with these natural health products. It's now called failed efficacy because they don't have to go through all this double-blind clinical trial process. And obviously they don't work. This is Health Canada. So if somebody takes a natural health product, well, they're gonna delay getting treatment of these drugs that we've approved because they work. And we say they work because we've been given two double-blind clinical trials that show they work. It's, it's quite, it's quite, a, it's quite corrupt. Now, <clears throat> so where I was wanting to go with this though is, is that, so we have this process where we're gonna require two double-blind clinical trials. And while, why I say we're not doing this for our safety is, you know, I kind of like the idea that you have to have two double-blind clinical trials to show a drug works and that the benefits outweigh the risk. I like that. So why don't we, and this is just a simple idea, why wouldn't we just say, no pharmaceutical companies, don't give me the two double-blind clinical trials. Don't give that to Health Canada. You give us like a million bucks or two million bucks, and we'll hire two different sets of researchers. You won't know who they are and they won't know who you are, and we'll design the trial. And you've told us you've done a whole bunch of research, your drug works, it should just sail through these double-blind clinical trials, and we'll run these two, and they'll show it works, and everyone will be happy, and Canadians will get drugs whose efficacy is, you know, outweighs the safety risks. It, now, isn't that simple? And you all nod your heads and go, of course, we'd actually get true science, wouldn't we? Right? So why are we doing it the way we're doing it? Do you think Health Canada doesn't know what's happening? Of course they know. But they want, this system is run by Health Canada the way it is because that's the way Health Canada wants it, for whatever reason. But it's not for your safety. See, I feel, when Health Canada says, no, if we say a drug works, it works, I might actually believe them if, if they did what I just said, instead of allowing pharmaceutical companies to hand them doctored research that might be two studies out of 20. I might believe them then, right? Now, <clears throat> what I think our, um, our drug system is for is to protect intellectual property rights. And let me explain how this works. So, 
remember I told you you have to go through this new drug approval process to get approved to treat a serious health condition and that this costs, you know, at least a billion dollars. <clears throat> well, who can go through that process? Only companies that have a novel chemical that has a long patent life on it, right? So, that, I mean, let's take Viagra as an example because it's just been a blockbuster. And I even forget, was it Pfizer? I'll, I'll use, but you know, big pharmaceutical company they go through this process, well, they've got intellectual property rights. So, as long as they have patent protection, nobody else can sell Viagra, unless they license it, and then they're, they're getting royalties. But, and so they can charge a fortune. They can charge 20 bucks a pill or whatever it was. I remember when it first came out, it was outrageous, the cost. And now that the patent protection is off, there's generic. The, the drug is Sidenafil, so you can buy Sidenafil under various names for probably two bucks a pill instead of 20 bucks because the patent protection's off. But you can go through that drug approval process. You, a, a major pharmaceutical company could easily have 10 drugs in the process. If even two get through and one's a blockbuster, they make hundreds of billions of dollars. That's how the game works. But it only works with censorship. It only works with censorship. So censorship is key to keeping this house of cards going or this house of mirrors going. And it works this way. So imagine all of us in this room, we come down with the same serious health condition. And we go to our medical doctor and our medical doctor says, oh yeah, this is a serious condition. And um, <clears throat> you're gonna have it for life. There's no, there's no cure, but I, I'm going to prescribe this drug to you. Um, now, it's a chemical pharmaceutical drug, and, and now let's be fair to the doctors. The only drugs that they can legally prescribe or recommend to you for serious health conditions are those approved up by Health Canada. And the only drugs that can get through this process are those with intellectual property rights. Which is why you will never see a natural health product approved for a serious health condition, there's no intellectual property rights. So even if, let's say, you know, you and me, we came up with this product that, you know, cures heart disease, like, oh my gosh, that's worth what, a trillion dollars? Well, if we raise the venture capital, a billion dollars to get through the process, as soon as we're through the process, we have no intellectual property rights. Everyone else in this room starts up a company and they will never get our money back, which is why we'll never raise the money to go through the process. Okay, so, so we're, we're in a state, we're gonna be in a state where we will never see, it'll never be legal to treat a serious health condition with a natural health product if we allow these changes to come down, but I, I'm getting off topic here. So um, I was talking about how censorship is necessary to protect intellectual property rights. So we all come down with a serious health condition. The doctor saying, okay, <clears throat> I'm prescribing you this chemical pharmaceutical drug which has patent protection, so it's you know, $8 a pill. You're gonna have to take it for the rest of your life. And understand this, you will never be well again. Okay, now, a lot of people face this all the time. I'm gonna talk about true hope and bipolar. You come down the stairs bipolar and they start putting you on the drug cocktails, you're never going to be well again, ever. In fact, you know, the one expert psychiatrist from Harvard I had to call in as, I had to subpoena him to get him on the stand in a bipolar trial, and he said he didn't understand, like once he started switching patients to this, this natural health product, which works better, he said 100% of patients made a point of sitting him down and explaining how their head's clear for the first time. He says doctors and psychiatrists do not understand how much of a mental fog these people are in, even after they've acclimatized to the drugs. So when I'm talking about us all having a serious health condition and being told we'll never be healthy again, this is a common thing. This is a common thing, and we are now gonna dutifully take that drug till the day we die, and we're gonna take other drugs to deal with the side effects, and rinse and repeat for the next person. And now you see how they've got their billions and billions of dollars back. But you need censorship because if the doctor also said, well, wait a second, you got that option, 
And you know, there's this natural health product that works, but it actually works better. I was gonna say just as well, but my gosh, it works better. And it doesn't have the side effects, and you know, it costs next to nothing. Well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna take it, and then the whole system breaks down. Health Canada's budget actually depends upon the fees that they charge for this new drug approval process, which I think is around 140,000 just to apply, right? So they'd actually have to lay off some people if they weren't collecting these fees from ph pharmaceutical companies and we didn't have this cost recovery. So this only works if there's censorship. It's, that, it's absolutely central that there be censorship. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll segue into why, <clears throat> why this is such a, a huge health concern. Uh, so let me tell you the true hope story. And then I'm going to read you some testimony from that psychiatrist. So, True Hope, how many, how many have heard of True Hope? Oh, okay, so just slightly less than half. So bear with me if you've heard the story. So True Hope uh, is a company that has a product, EMPower Plus, that treats bipolar disorder. And as you would expect for a company that treats bipolar disorder, uh, the founders, one was a property manager, and the other was an animal nutritionist. Well, that kind of actually sounds funny, doesn't it? You wouldn't expect that. Now, the property manager's wife had bipolar disorder, and she committed suicide. And two of his uh, children had bipolar disorder. His oldest daughter, Autumn, was, was out of the house and married. Um, but she was spending almost half of her life involuntarily committed to the cycle. So she would just become so suicidal and so out of control, she would be involuntarily committed. They would put her on a drug cocktail, which would just like zombie her out. And she'd actually have to stay in the hospital until she acclimatized enough to be sent home. And then as she acclimatized more, she would you know, become sick again and then back involuntarily committed. And that was her life, okay? So, Autumn is just having an awful time, and he had a son, Joseph, who was 17, big guy, like we're talking, when he was a teenager, he was probably about 6'1 and 200 pounds, and not a, not a cell of fat on him. And he would rage that his doctor was trying to control his bipolar with lithium, which is, you know, the mainstream drug for it, and just not working. <clears throat> and so, Tony, the, the guy whose family is falling apart with this, is, uh, is actually, at a church function inspecting a building with the animal nutritionist who's on the same committee. And the animal nutritionist, oh, well, how are you doing? And it's like, well, do you really want to know? And he just starts venting. He just had to get it out. And the animal nutritionist stopped him, David Hardy, and he said, you know, I don't know anything about human, human nutrition and health, but this rage you're describing in Joseph, it actually reminds me of uh, ear and tail biting in pigs where they just rage. And when that happens, we know it's a nutritional deficiency. We supplement their feed with vitamins and minerals, and 100% of the time, the behavior goes away. So they start researching. And they're reading study after study, book after book, and they're trying to figure out what exactly do you need for mental health, because they're going to come up with a protocol, and they're arguing, and they're fighting, and they're back and forth, and they come up with a protocol. And then they start looking for products that will have everything that they think you need. And they come up with three off-the-shelf products. And they give them, they put Joseph on this. And you know what? Joseph didn't get well. What? He was different. So they added another product. And this, this other product was just a, called a colloidal mineral. I guess there's a whole bunch of biomass somewhere in the States. Did I just use my mic? They mine it and they squeeze it. Could be the battery. I'm happy to just yell at you. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, we're, we're okay for now. We'll go as, as long as we can. So, anyway, they, they dig up this biomass, they squeeze it, they put it into bottles and sell it because it's got a whole bunch of minerals that are called colloidal, just bioavailable because it's already tied to an organic molecule. They give it to Joseph. So now Joseph is on four products. And he gets well. And then uh, Autumn, the daughter, she doesn't live in the same same city. She 
uh, lived in Edmonton at the time, and they lived in southern Alberta. And, and Autumn's husband calls Tony and says, Tony, Autumn's out of the psych ward, but, you know, she's on 24-hour suicide watch. And so when I go to work, I've been dropping her off at my parents. But they're just exhausted. <coughs> Could I drop her off for a couple of weeks? And, you know, just to give my parents a break and give me a break. And Tony says, sure. So they drop Autumn off. And eventually convince her to try this protocol, and she gets well. And they wean her off her psychiatric drugs, and she stays well. Now this is probably about 15 years ago. She's never been back in a psych ward, has been able to have other kids. She couldn't because of the drugs she was on. And she wrote a best-selling book called The Promise of Hope. So then these guys, <coughs> you know, I'll, I'll kind of truncate, but they end up forming a company for the sole purpose of promoting research into using nutrition to treat uh, mental health. But people started coming to them saying, hey, you know, we need your help. And they said, well, we're not selling anything, but if you let us track your symptoms, we'll tell you what to do. And before you know it, they literally had hundreds of people buying these products from just whatever stores, but, but following, following their advice and filling out questionnaires and they're actually learning. And then, uh, then these people start coming to them saying it's not working. And what was the problem was this colloidal mineral varied from batch to batch. And a few of the batches had hardly anything in it, like they, they paid labs to analyze. And they realized they had to get somebody to make a consistent product and then EM Power Plus was born. <coughs> so they end up you know, growing this business. I think, I think my mic's gone, so I'm just gonna have to holler, which is, a little more comfortable than holding that to my mouth anyway. So they end up uh, starting this business and they're, they're managing, actually most of their clients aren't in Canada, but they have thousands of people in Canada. And they don't have, I'm just gonna see if I can turn this off. So they, they start this company, and, but they don't have Health Canada's approval to sell their product. Now, back then, nobody had Health Canada approval. You couldn't get Health Canada approval we didn't have the natural health product regulations. And for like their product, literally it's just a vitamin and mineral supplement. It's, it's now you go to your health food store and just buy this vitamin. And it's called the same thing, and it's the same thing that they use to treat serious mental illness. But they couldn't get approval back then. And Health Canada says, well, you shut down. And they say, there's no way we're shutting down because we've got thousands of people whose very lives depend on this product. And if we shut down, they're going to die. And doctors and psychiatrists were writing to Health Canada, don't you dare take this product away. So <clears throat> the product, the, the business is in Alberta, but the product's manufactured in the States. And so if you ordered it, it would get shipped across. So Health Canada s starts seizing shipments at the border and telling Canada Border Services to turn stuff away. Now, in Alberta, you had Ron Lajeunesse, who used to be your deputy minister and ran all of the, the mental health programs in Alberta, but he was at the time president of the Canadian Mental Health Association. He started holding press conferences saying there will be suicides if Health Canada does not relent. And then he started holding press conferences about the suicides as people ran out. And when I was preparing for this trial, I because um, they were charged criminally, so I have to defend them because they were selling without <coughs> Health Canada's approval. Well, I started calling people that depended on the product. And <coughs> every single person who lived through this period where the product was being restricted volunteered something to me I hadn't even thought of asking. And you have to understand, these were the people that the regular psychiatric drugs just didn't work. Like they had been through them all, they were in and out of psych wards. You know, if you all had serious bipolar disorder and we'd agreed to come back in six years, half of you wouldn't be here. And in 12 years, half again. Like the lifespan of these people were, it was nothing. <clears throat> but they pretty well to a T when I'm interviewing them said, you know, I had a suicide plan because I was not willing to actually go in I wasn't willing to be sick again. That the experience was so, so these are people that are not sick. They're not sick, 
They're making a suicide plan while they're healthy because they are not willing to go back to the hell that they were living without this product. So, in fact, I, it's probably 100% of people I witnessed, you know, interviewed, had a suicide plan that they would implement if they ran out. And what happened is smuggling rings developed all across the country where participants got together with family members to start smuggling, but we had suicides, we had deaths, we had press conferences by the Canadian Mental Health Association about the suicides. So then we have this trial, and I want to read to you because we're talking about health freedom here, right? And maybe before I read this bit of testimony from this doctor, there we go. She just unplugged something from the wall, so this is great. So, one of our problems, so it just will allow me to segue before I get back to this doctor's testimony. One of the problems we're actually facing is, is a belief, a, a crisis of belief here. And our beliefs are wrong, and Health Canada's beliefs are wrong. And actions follow beliefs. And let me just use discrimination as an example, because in Canada we've made some pretty good progress dealing with discrimination. And we've made that progress because we've actually attacked the belief that, wait a second, it's not okay to believe that I'm better because, and the because doesn't matter, because of sex, because of age, because of you know race. It, it doesn't matter what the because is. It, it's the actual belief that I'm better or you better because of, of some quality. We've said, no, that's actually false. But if we didn't attack the belief, we'd just be attacking actions. Because actions flow from the belief that you're, one group's better than another. So we could attack, oh wait, this group can't vote, that's not fair. So the problem we have in the area of health is that <clears throat> Health Canada believes that you and I do not have the right to take whatever we decide to take, regardless of how well informed we are. They believe that you only have the right to access treatments that they say you can access. It's very, very paternalistic. And in fact, they will put people in jail and destroy them for trying to even share truthful information with you or providing a product that you might need. And you see, I believe in health freedom, and I believe in health freedom because we're all having a very personal journey here. I don't even know if these chairs are uncomfortable, but you do because you're having that experience. And all of us here, we're gonna die. We're, all of us are gonna die. And along the way, we're going to have some real, most of us are going to have some tremendous suffering. And a certain percentage of us in this room, the suffering is going to be so bad that we're going to kill ourselves, a certain percentage. And almost everyone in this room, we're going to go through suffering so bad we're going to think about it. And many of us in this room have already had those thoughts when we're going through those health crises. And I'm seeing some heads nod. So, Health Canada, an MP, a bureaucrat, cannot live my pain, cannot live my death. And just the idea that I have to suffer, or that I have to go through only the access, only what they say I can access, just does not resonate with me. Now I'm all for, let's have total truth. In fact, instead of hiding clinical trial evidence, or hiding the lack of evidence, how about, what if it was the law that for every drug, for everything used for a health purpose, whether it's natural or whether it's chemical, that you have to tell all the evidence or lack of evidence. And let me use Truop as an example. I mean, here we had people that were approaching them. They knew there was no research. They knew they were the research. All these initial participants, they were the research. They knew that Health Canada hadn't said this drug worked, that it was approved. They knew exactly what the score was, but all the approved drugs didn't work for them, and they wanted the, the right to try it. Now let me, now that I've set the stage, go back to this 
you know, psychiatrist that I called in this trial. You know, the interesting, and I'm not wearing a watch, I just want to, can somebody tell me the time? Okay, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Because I also have to talk about, I'm going to finish this story and then go into the self-care framework and what you need to do about it. So, <clears throat> this psychiatrist that I had to subpoena to get on the stand, his name is Dr. Charles Popper. He is the uh, founding editor of the jo Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology, which is the first and, you know, blue, most blue chip um, medical journal in using chemical psychiatric drugs to treat mental illness in children and adolescents. He is an expert in using chemical pharmaceuticals. For roughly 25 years, he was the only psychiatrist that Harvard University would allow to have a clinical practice in any of their teaching hospitals. And he got the bipolar patients, primarily kids and adolescents, that the other psychiatrists in the Boston area couldn't handle. So he got the worst of the worst, okay? He, um, there are two psychiatric bodies in the United States that certify child and adolescent psychiatrists. He developed their standards for both of those bodies. And he pioneered the use of chemical pharmaceutical drugs to treat depression in children and adolescents. He was totally Mr. Pharmaceutical. And his story, are you, are you interested in this story? I just let me know. Okay. Because yeah. it's truly, it's truly a great story. So, <clears throat> he's totally Mr. Pharmaceutical. But what happened was, this, you know, Tony and David and Trubel, they actually got the, um, the Behavioral Research Unit at the University of Calgary to run two case series. One case series on bipolar adults, and one on, not bipolar kids, but any kids that had behavioral problems that the psychiatrists in the Calgary area couldn't handle, refer to this trial, and they put them on EMPAR+. Plus. Um, and both of these were published in peer-reviewed journals, one in the Journal of Psychiatry and the other in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. So, and both of these groups, they got, like 80% got well, and then the psychiatrists took them off their meds and they stayed well. It just, it blew the researchers' minds. So the, the faculty of medicine at the University of Calgary, this behavioral research unit, goes to the Alberta government that had a science foundation and said, look at this. Like this, this is off the charts. The taxpayer needs to fund a double-blind clinical trial. And the government of Alberta said, you are right. And so they funded this double-blind clinical trial that's being run by a children's hospital at the University of Calgary. Halfway through the trial, what happens? Health Canada tells them to shut it down. Well, and Health Canada told them to shut it down because they didn't have Health Canada approval. Let's ignore that nobody in Canadian history had ever gotten Health Canada approval for nutrition research ever before. Let's ignore that there were guidelines to do that at the time. And let's ignore that this team of researchers that were experts in running clinical trial research could not get Health Canada approval for love and money, and so the, <coughs> the trial became a wash. But the lead researcher, Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, she did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, and she was going back and she wanted to present this at Harvard. And so her, you know, psychiatrist friend at Harvard was trying to get other psychiatrists to come to this presentation on using nutrition to treat mental illness. And this guy asks Dr. Popper, hey, this, this you know, researcher's coming and they want to present this. And Dr. Popper, and he said this on the stamp. He said, you know, I wasn't interested in that. I mean, I've been a journal editor for 10 years. I, I know all of the research. I've seen nothing to suggest that nutrition has any effect on mental health. He just thought it was rubbish. And this guy kept bugging him. And finally, he said, I realized that if I don't, I will actually save time if I go to this presentation, because this guy's gonna just keep bugging me. So he agrees to go, and he goes, and he says, they started saying things that I just knew weren't true. And so they were like strike, like strike one, strike two, strike three, at strike three he left. And I'll try to remember what they were. The first one was, is they were explaining how EM Power Plus um, will start having an effect after two weeks. And he goes, well, strike one, our fastest fast acting drug, lithium, you know, takes longer than, to get up to a low dose before we can even think of, you know, and, you know, strike two, it amplifies drugs. I forget what strike three was. And he said, I just realized this was such rubbish that I wasn't even willing to sit in the room anymore. But you know how we're polite with people? So he's like, Oh, I've got an appointment, I gotta go, but this is so interesting. Do you have like 
a list of ingredients just so I can look into it more. And uh, Tony and David are there. They don't have a list of ingredients. But they say, you know, we got a bottle and it's got a list of ingredients. And they're trying to give him a bottle and he doesn't want them. And they're like Ukrainian grandmothers, I speak from experience. And, you, know, you can't get out of the house without that gift. So finally he takes it. And he, he's, he's in a Harvard teaching hospital. He says he gets out of the room, he sticks it under his lab coat, he doesn't want anyone to see he's got this bottle of vitamins. He marches to his office and he puts it behind a stack of you know journals so that nobody can see it. And then he's got nothing to do and the phone rings. And it is a child psychiatrist friend who says, Charles, I, I've been regretting that I've been putting off this call. But my 10-year-old son is raging, and he's raging, and he's raging, and it's going on and on and on, and we can't put it off anymore. Will you take him as a patient? And he says, sure, I've got nothing to do right now. Come on in. So child psychiatrist, dad, mom, and this kid show up, and Charles Popper explained he could have put this kid in the hospital, or he could have institutionalized the kid right there and then. The kid was so bad. And... Uh, the dad, child psychiatrist wants him to write a script for pharmaceutical drugs, but the policy that Dr. Popper made is you don't do that on the first visit for a 10-year-old. You only after a second visit with at least a, a two-week wait. He's not going to violate his own policy, even though it's a child psychiatrist saying, no, come on, I mean, I've waited, like, let's not play this game. And they're arguing. And he won't leave. And so finally, Popper remembers, oh, I've got this bottle. And he pulls it up. And he says, I was totally honest with this guy. I told him, just got it at this meeting and the ridiculous things they said and that I left because I thought it was bunk, but you told me you're not gonna leave unless I give you something. Well, here you go, honey. <laughs> well, okay. So, off they go. And, and this, is, this is all in the court transcript under oath. He says, I'm expecting the phone to ring the next day because when I see a child that bad, I end up babysitting the parents for the two weeks because they just can't have them. Phone doesn't ring day one. Phone doesn't ring day two. Phone doesn't ring, I don't think, my child's doing really well. Like, I, I, I can't believe it. And he, they bring the kid in on week one, so seven days. No, <clears throat> it was week two. And this kid is totally normal. And, uh, and Popper can't believe it. Like, he would have institutionalized this kid two weeks ago. This kid's perfectly normal. And the parents say, you know, we ordered more. <laughs> but it hasn't come yet. But it hasn't come yet. Oh, well, don't worry. Well, a couple of days later, the dad's on the phone in a panic. This is, you know, beginning of December, saying he's raging again. And <clears throat> we booked a ski vacation because it's been years since we've been even been able to think of going anywhere with him because his behavior is so bad. Well, he got normal. We booked a ski vacation. What did we do? And Popper said, I'll figure something out. He goes to the health food store. He spends the afternoon in the health food store with the list of ingredients, picking off-the-shelf products that would approximate him Power Plus, gives it to the family. They go on their vacation. They come back, and the parents say he's about 60% as well as on Ian Power Plus, and the teacher says he's about 60% as well, and Popper goes, ding, now I know there's something to this. It wasn't a placebo, right? And then the Empire Plus comes and this kid goes better. So then he had a, um, a adult female patient who it didn't matter what drug cocktail he put her on, she just couldn't function. And he gave her the opportunity to try Empire Plus and she got well. And then he started giving all of his other patients the things. So um, at the trial, he told the court that Ian Power Plus destroyed his practice. And when asked why, he said, well, listen, when I had all my patients on the chemical pharmaceutical drugs, I had to meet with every patient weekly because I'm counseling them not to commit suicide. Remember, he has the worst of the worst. And I'm having to manage the side effects from the drug cocktail. But the Empower Plus patients, I meet with every three to six months, and we just have coffee. So he, he, he had to take on way more patients. So, but it's interesting, I asked him on the stand, and this is where I'm gonna to read to you, and we're getting back to health freedom, because remember we're talking about, shouldn't you have the right to take something that Health Canada hasn't approved? 
especially if you know full well, like it's totally disclosed to you. You're not being fooled, you're not being tricked. You know it's just experimental. You, you know there isn't the research. He was on the stand, and I said to him, and it's a total improper question, I know it was an improper question, and I said, Dr. Proper, <clears throat> something like, well, if you came down with, with bipolar disorder, what would you do? And uh, a funny thing happened is um, the Crown didn't object, but the judge stopped me and said to the Crown, um, you know, Mr. Brown, are you, uh, you going to object? And, and Mr. Brown stands up and he goes, um, something like, well, you know, like, I know I could, but I want to hear the answer. And the judge, <laughs> and the judge said, I do too. And that's how I get to, I have to re-ask the question because we've gone through all of this. But this is instructive to health freedom. So um, let me just find that part of my notes. Because I'm kind of jumping around today, so just bear with me. <clears throat> it's just, um, okay, so here we are. So this is me now re-asking the question, and this is direct quotes, so question. Okay, so you can't tell us what you would choose for a patient. But I'm going to ask you, if you came down with bipolar disorder, what would you do after you got over the panic? Answer? And the reaction to your question? I actually probably would choose EM power. I know the trials aren't there. But I've seen it. And I think given the choice between committing myself to a lifetime of lesser stability and mental fogging, I would first want to try in Power Plus. Now when he says, I know the trials aren't there, he's meaning, I know the two double-blind clinical trials that are needed to get Health Canada or FDA approval aren't there. This is a, this is a journal editor. He knows the drug approval process. He knows about clinical evidence. He says, I know the trials aren't there. But, I've seen it. That's anecdotal evidence. Not double blind clinical, I've seen it. And, you know, having to choose between a lifetime of lesser stability, so he needs on the approved drugs, or EM Power Plus, I would choose EM Power Plus. That, that's health freedom. Do, do you see that? That's health freedom. Because Health Canada would say, as soon as he says, I know the trials aren't there, oh, stop, we're done. Trials aren't there, nobody can access this product. That's Health Canada's approach. Do you know that it's illegal for True Hope to read to you what I just read to you? Did you know that? This is a court transcript that I, I read part of, but no company in Canada could share stuff like that because they are sharing information that is suggesting that their product can be used for a non-approved Health Canada claim. Now, I think there's probably about now 30 published studies on EM Power Plus and its use on mental health, all funded by governments and universities. I think four different countries around the world have put public money into researching this, including Canada. They can't share with you, it's illegal for them to share with you the public research the public research that's done in the product. The only thing, and this is, this is, this is where the censorship is so important for your health. The only thing that they can legally say to you is the Health Canada approved claim, which is something like supports mental health and well-being. Now, <clears throat> let's just say, I, I've got three adult kids, my youngest is 21. Let's say my 21 year old comes down with serious bipolar disorder. And we've gone through all of the psychiatric drugs and they're just not working. And he's one of these ones in and out of psych wards. And the doctors actually sat me down and said, Mr. Buckley, you know for those short windows, like where he's acclimatizing but hasn't gone completely cuckoo again, so he's kind of himself, you enjoy it. You, don't you work, don't you do anything but spend time? Because he's not gonna be here in a few years because statistically he's not. And I'm searching for answers and I go to the health food store and I'm staring at EM Power Plus and I see
Advocacy to Health Canada approved claim supports mental health and well-being. Well, I know I need to buy that product for my son. <coughs> not. I don't know a thing. Because I'm not allowed to know. I'm not allowed to know, and that product will never get through the new drug approval process and will, because it doesn't have intellectual property rights. So it is illegal for me to be told, and it's illegal for you to be told. And we're pretending that censorship is okay. This, like Health Canada will say, this is, this is to protect you from fraud. Because how do we know these are fraudulent claims? Well, what if we made the law? Well, you have to share. Hey, we don't have any information. This is, we just did this research and we put this together and Joseph did okay and Autumn did okay and that's it. That's, well, so what? So what if, if the law was you had to share the good, the bad, or the ugly so that people would be fully informed? What's, what's wrong with that? Where, where did we get to this point where somebody could say, and remember, like I say, your, your health journey is your own. How did we get to this point where it's like, you can, you're only allowed as an adult to take what Health Canada says you can take, like really? And we trust these guys? And companies aren't allowed to share with us truthful information? Like, how did we arrive there? Well, we arrived there for intellectual property rights. So what's happening now with the self-care framework? Let me share with you a little bit of the history about how we arrived at our current regulations for natural <coughs> products. So, in the late 80s, early 90s, Health Canada started attacking natural products. And the way they were doing it was saying, well, you don't comply with our regulations. Now, the regulations were made for chemical drugs. You couldn't comply. And they were driving product after product out the market. And people like you got mad. And all across the country raised a big fuss. And the government backed down. The uh, health minister at the time, Alan Rock, actually stopped some uh, cost recovery regulations that were going to come into force and asked the Standing Committee of Health, which is an old party committee in, in the House of Commons that looks into health issues. And so he asked the Standing Committee of Health, will you please look into how to regulate natural health products? And the Standing Committee of Health held the broadest consultations of any standing committee in Canadian history up to that point. In fact, I went through the witness list the other day. They, were, they listened to 315 witnesses and um, over a thousand written submissions and briefs. And they came up with a whole bunch of recommendations, but their prime one was, it is totally inappropriate to regulate natural health products under the same regulations as chemical drugs. The risk profile isn't the same. The approach to the science isn't the same. The philosophy, the whole thing, you need a department that is well versed in these types of products with separate regulations. You may even want to not call them drugs but create a, a different category for them because they're truly, it's inappropriate to even consider them in the same category as chemical pharmaceutical drugs. And <clears throat> the government said we adopt all of these recommendations and then Health Canada had a couple of different expert panels to guide them, well how do we then adhere to these recommendations and we come up with the natural health product regulations. No. I think they're total overkill, but I don't have time to tell you about that, but <clears throat> at least our natural health product regulations on paper allow serious health claims to be made. So in a natural health product, under our natural health product regulations, in theory, can be approved to treat a serious health condition. In practice, Health Canada is limiting claims to more structure function claims. So for True Hope, they can't say treats bipolar disorder, they have to say supports mental health and well-being. You know, a product that might treat arthritis, they could say, well, you know, good for joint health, they can't say treats arthritis. But So we're being limited by a policy choice to structure function claims, but at least on paper, our law allows for serious health claims to be made under these regulations. So, these regulations came into force 14 years ago. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. There was a licensing backlog for about a decade. Health Canada had to learn this. The industry was unhappy. But finally, we're through it. Most products are now licensed. <clears throat> People know what to expect. The, the natural health community is actually quite happy with these regulations. Nobody's complaining. And then all of a sudden, Health Canada says, you know what, 
<clears throat> we're going to come up with a new self-care framework. And what we're going to do is we've got these regulations for prescription drugs. Well, we're leaving them alone. This is our new drug process and that. <clears throat> but we're going to take our chemical non-prescription drugs, so all your over-the-counter over stuff, be that, you know, Tylenol or aspirin or cold, you know, you name it. And we're going to regulate them with natural health products under a single set of regulations. Oh, <laughs> we were there before. We just went through this 20-year process to have separate regulations, and now they're saying, no, no, we're going to have to get rid of the natural health product regulations and regulate the same. But let's talk about claims because under the natural health product regulation there's no limits on the claims that you could make. <clears throat> but for self-care products, claims, if it's a condition that you would seek a healthcare practitioner for, and not just a medical doctor, but you know, a nutritionist or a, you know, a nurse or a naturopathic, anything that you would actually a condition you need to go see a healthcare practitioner for, you can't make the claim for. That's not an over-the-counter product. Okay, so we're now basically saying, no, no, natural health products are only going to be used for structure function. You know, so for nutritional deficiencies, not for treating any meaningful illness. And so the only option then to get approval to treat any other condition is what? the chemical new drug approval process, which costs a billion dollars. It wouldn't cost a billion dollars for a lesser condition, but it would still be ridiculous and no one will ever go through it. So <clears throat> one of the most scary things is, is that we're, there's gonna be further censorship. Another thing that is happening is, is there will be people in this room that will remember Bill C-51, and, and John had mentioned it earlier. Um, back in, in Harper's first term, um, they introduced a bill in 2008 uh, to amend the Food and Drug Act, and basically what it was doing, it was upping the, the penalties and giving Health Canada a whole bunch of powers. <clears throat> and so for example, um, right now, let's say we were running a natural health product company and we were running afoul of the regulations and we were charged, um, the maximum fine would be $5,000 per offense. And an offense could last a week, it could last a month, you know. But <clears throat> they wanted up the fine to $5 million a day. Okay? And <clears throat> they wanted to give Health Canada power so an inspector could say, well, do this. And, you know, it was quite broad. And if you didn't, that was an offense. So Health Canada could tell you to take action that would actually be harmful and there would be nothing you could do. And, and when I say Health Canada could tell you to take an action that's harmful, remember they're not there to protect your health. And in my law practice, I give advice to natural health product companies, and they usually, they're calling me when Health Canada is telling them to do things. And, you know, one example I have is natokinase. Does anyone, everyone here know what natokinase? So it's an, it's an enzyme that is a pretty safe blood thinner that can be used. And, a lot of doctors in Canada were managing patients on natokinase instead of the chemical blood thinners. But just as you know, doctors, it was in the news, the doctors were complaining about these deaths caused by Pradaxa, Health Canada decides to take natokinase off the market. And a lot of medical doctors were saying, are you crazy? And one of my clients said, well, we just got you know, direction by Health Canada to recall all of our natokinase, and so, you know, my office, we hired a medical doctor who said, you, you just can't do that. Leave it on the shelves, let all of your customers know they can order from the states, but ethically, you have to give people an opportunity to adjust and transition. You just can't take vital medication being prescribed by a doctor way overnight. So I'm just giving it as an example. Like Health Canada tells people to do stupid things that they know will cause, the people know will cause death or harm if they follow it, and then they're liable for criminal negligence. Health Canada is. So, but these new powers would allow Health Canada could say, hey, you do this, and if you don't, hey, you recall, if you don't, too bad. Hey, we want you to run a double-blind clinical trial. Wait a second, this is gonna bankrupt me. I'll just stop selling the product. No, I told you to do it, and you do it. And it's $5 million a day in jail if you don't. Like, just ridiculous powers. So, <clears throat> we 
we rebelled against that and built C51 and we stopped it. So they come out with Vanessa's law, Bill C17, where they're bringing in these powers and penalties, but they only apply to a new category of product called therapeutic product. And therapeutic product says, you know, basically it's all drugs except natural health products as defined in the natural health product regulations. And so we now got these powers in the Food and Drug Act, but they don't apply to natural health products as defined in the in our natural health product regulations. But if they if they um, basically repeal the natural health product regulations, then these powers and penalties are going to apply to these new self care products. So basically, you know, we've been gamed. So we didn't raise a fuss and we allowed Bill C-17 to pass, thinking that we were safe. And now all they have to do is drop the regulation. It doesn't even take a vote in the House of Commons. And we basically lost the battle. And well, what's super important about this, and I can tell you that natural, no natural health product company can withstand $5 million day fines in these, like it's just, so when Health Canada says, jump or take a product off the market, it's gone. And like people like me are gonna have to say, well, there's nothing you can do because you're just gonna get crushed like a bug. So <clears throat> this is not a positive development. And because this can be done by regulation, we won't have much time. You see, if they have to amend an act, then the House of Commons has to vote on it three times and it goes to committee after second reading and it takes months. You know, those of you waiting for cannabis know this, right? And, it can take months. That Senate, they added two and a half months, right? It was supposed to be July 1st. So, so it can take time, and we have time to mobilize and then create pressure. But with regulation, all they do is they publish the proposed regulation in the Canada Gazette, which is just the federal government, basically, newspaper equivalent, although it's a little more formal. And there's not even a set comment time, but, you know, they usually wait at least a couple of weeks for public comment. And then if they publish it a second time, it's law. There's no vote. Opposition MPs are not involved at all. And government MPs aren't involved at all. This is just, this is just done by the bureaucracy, you know, the government following the bureaucracy. So we have very little time to mobilize, which is why I'm asking every single person in this room to join Citizens for Choice in Healthcare this is, as I say, one of the longest standing groups, one of the, they have been involved all along the way and they're just quality. And give them your email address because as action is necessary, it only works if you and you and you take action. Coming to a lecture doesn't put pressure on the government. But I can tell you a letter is worth, you know, 100 emails because it's easy to send an email, but a handwritten, especially a handwritten letter, oh my gosh, it, it is, they, they pay attention to that, and phone calls and personal visits with your MP. Personal visit is better than a letter, but it's kind of, you know, different degrees of separation. So if you're in sales, a personal meeting is worth more than a telephone call, but a telephone call is worth more than a letter, and a letter's worth more than an email. And so, you know, <coughs> it's very important and we're just starting, starting to get in the process of waking people up. So, uh, and I think you'd be essential for that. So thank you very much. And like I said, I think we'll land, but I'll hang around a few questions.